Welcome to the VU Meters YouTube channel. I'm your host, Rich, and in this video, I'm going to be walking you through my hi fi hideaway. First off is the room itself. Everything in here was picked for a very specific reason. It either serves a functional purpose or it has some aesthetic appeal. I wanted to create a warm, welcoming environment to enjoy music with friends and family. And also, it's just a lot of stuff that I like myself. So honestly, a lot of the time I'm down here listening by myself, doing shootouts, filming content for the YouTube channel, and just enjoying myself at the end of a long day. So I like to be surrounded by things that I enjoy and things that make me happy. So that was my overall intent with designing the room. Some examples include lamps. I like having a lot of light, but I like soft, like indirect light. So you see a lot of the lamps have like fabric on them. The one in the corner over there is covered in paper. That both serves a function of throwing off light, but also of helping dissipate some of those standing waves and create an acoustically well-sounding room. Some of the things that are a little more obvious are these panels behind me. Those are from GIK Acoustics. But in terms of getting the acoustics of the room balanced just right, I chose to opt for more of a organic sense of a diffusion in room treatment. Uh, big curtains, big rugs, uh, plants, bookcases, record shelves. Uh, things like even those ottomans that were in the corner you could see in the video. I tried to use as much natural material as possible to create a room that did, wasn't only warm and inviting in a place you'd want to hang out in, but obviously being a dedicated listening room, a place where music would sound good. So that brings me to the construction of the room itself. So this is finished basement space, so underneath the floor is solid concrete, which helps when you have all that heavy equipment sitting on it. Uh, you don't have to worry about any footfalls or any vibrations coming through the floor. That is all well taken care of. And looking at the top, another thing that helps with both form and function is the ceiling. So I opted to go for a drop ceiling. I have commercial tiles in there that are designed to not reflect sound, but also keep sound from getting into the room and coming out of the room. Figured that wasn't going to be enough, so above that ceiling, I have a three-inch thick layer of rock wool insulation. That helps with the sound deadening, again, both coming in and out of the room. And then above that, there's actually the joist for the floor above that has all of the uh, standard home insulation for warmth. So I really have three layers of insulation between myself and the floor above, which is great because I could be down here listening to music and it's like a low muffle at most upstairs so it does create a space that can be used uh, pretty much any time of the day without disrupting anyone else inside the house so another piece of the room and wanting to keep it warm and inviting is people are going to want to sit down and have a drink so we do have a fridge in there i keep it well stocked at all times as well as a little mini bar on the counter over there so typically i enjoy that myself at the end of a long day when i'm sitting down listening to some music uh, I like to offer that to others when they come to visit. So again, that sort of warm, inviting, homey sort of feel where it's a place that people want to come and they want to stay and spend time, enjoy some conversation, enjoy some music. Deliberately do not have a television anywhere down here. Typically, if people finish the basement, they're putting in like a big movie theater, like a TV room. Uh, that's great for people to do that and enjoy that, but I think it helps add to the uniqueness of the space, having such a large space without any TV in it, so people can really focus on the music or on some conversation, or sometimes a little bit of both. My turntable is an SME Model 20-3. I upgraded to this from an SME Model 12A for two reasons. First is this dual chassis design, so you can see the top part of the turntable where the platter and the tone arm are, are suspended via those four towers with O-rings on them and completely adjustable. They're suspended to keep them away from things like the motor and any of the power supplies that can create noise. This creates a really black background that I like, super, super quiet when the turntable's on and when it's running, which I really like. The second reason is the SME Series V tone arm that came with this table. The SME Series V tone arm is an iconic design. It's been in production since the 1980s. It's still highly regarded as one of the finest tone arms available. What I like about this coming from another SME tone arm, the 309, is the adjustability. Adjusting things is super quick and easy on the Series 5 tone arm. Things like vertical tracking angle or overhang are a lot easier to change than they were on the 309. 
One of the knocks on it, though, is that you cannot adjust the azimuth on it, and that is one of the things that people cite as one of the reasons that it's maybe not, you know, a perfect tone arm. But I'm really happy with it. I feel that the bass response has been better, tighter, and deeper with this table and with this tone arm. On that Series 5 tone arm, I have right now the Triangle Art Zeus. That's a moving coil cartridge. My other cartridge that I swap in and out is an Ortophone Cadenza Bronze. Also a moving coil cartridge. I'll talk a little bit about moving coil and moving magnet and the differences when I talk about my phono stage. That tone arm goes out via XLR or balanced audio sensibility cables. That's a maker in Canada. They make a lot of the cables and interconnects that I use. The table also has a screw down weight that goes in the middle, helps get out some little minor warps, uh, helps the record sit super flat and make good contact. I have a couple of accessories out that I use or I recommend. First and foremost to brushes, both a stylus brush and a record brush. I use those on every single side of a record. When I start playing it or when I flip it, I do that 100% of the time. Another thing I do 100% of the time is what looks like that curling stone over there is actually a Furitech D-STAT 2. So I live in a climate where static electricity is an issue for me a big part of the year. So I like using that. It's almost like a little fan that blows like charged particles on it. I don't know really how it works, but I know that it works. I used a Milky Zero Stat before that. I found that a little finicky and the crystals could wear out. It was a little harder to use. This one I find easy use is much better. And with this one, you can just change the batteries with like the Milky guns. When those crystals go, you have to replace the entire gun. And then beside that is a Flux Hi-Fi uh, ultrasonic stylus cleaner. Other brands make those now. There's a Hudson Hi-Fi one you can get on Amazon that I'm sure is the same, or if not, very, very similar. Uh, one note with that, when you do use that, you want to make sure that you turn your vertical tracking force all the way down. If you don't do that, it'll put unwanted stress on your cantilever, which can damage your cartridge. So that is my turntable and a few accessories that I use daily and that I recommend. Now the phono preamp. My current phono preamp is a Boulder 508. My history with preamps, I started with an integrated amplifier that had a phono preamp built in. Then I used a separate phono preamp into that integrated amplifier, and now this setup. So why do you need a phono preamplifier? Because your cartridge puts out a really, really, really weak signal, and that signal needs to be boosted before it can go into your preamp. So this will take that signal and bring it up to what's called line level. This is a really simple preamp. There's a power switch and a mute button on the front and one switch on the back. That switch will switch between moving magnet and moving coil. I'm not an expert, but I'll give you a really quick difference. Moving magnet cartridges, the magnet is attached to the cantilever and then it vibrates as the cantilever bounces up and down and the coils are fixed. In a moving coil, it's the opposite. The coil is fixed to the cantilever and the magnet is fixed inside of the cartridge and the coils will move up and down. The net result typically is that moving magnet cartridges put out more output than a moving coil. So hence a moving coil needs to be boosted a little more. So for my digital source, I have a Hi-Fi Rose RS250. So this is an all-in-one complete network streamer. So you can stream the music that you have saved locally from your files. You can do things like access title or any other streaming services that you can log in with. You can even watch videos on it. I don't know, you'd want to sit in front of it and watch a video, but you can listen to the audio from some videos on it if you wanted to do that. It also has a built-in DAC, which is great. So it really truly is an all-in-one device. Uh, one of the things I really like about this is just the ease of use. It's one box. It does a lot, like 70 to 80% of the time. I'm usually listening to vinyl when I'm down here, but it is nice to have the convenience of a streamer here. If I just want to pop in, listen to some files that I have downloaded or do things like play something on Tidal, I can control it directly from my phone. It has VU meters, which is a big plus. It is customizable, so you could pick, you know, what different colors you want or different backgrounds or how you want it to behave when you're playing music. You can even do things if you just want to listen to it. You can shut the screen off and not have the screen going at all while you're using it. So I really love this. I'm super happy with this device. Uh, glad to have it. Great to try out new music that I want to listen to on my system. Maybe I'm considering a vinyl purchase. 
Uh, this is also connected to my preamp. This, unlike everything else in the system, is connected via RCA. So these are single-ended Kimber RCA cables that I have going out to that Pass Labs XP12 preamp. So this is my digital source. And next up is my preamplifier. So before this, I had an integrated amplifier. So that's where you have a preamplifier and the power amplifier in one chassis. It is efficient. Some of them have built-in phono preamps, mine did, that I utilized. Uh, so it is a really efficient way to listen to music. But when I started upgrading and breaking out the system and putting it into my new listening space, I did want to go the separates route. I chose Pass Labs. This is a Pass Labs XP12. Nelson Pass is an iconic designer, one of the best known names in the industry. No one's really ever unhappy with Pass Labs products. They stand by them. They're easy relatively to get repaired here in the US. And they don't come out with new models like every two or three years even. Typically about nine or 10 years is when you'll see a new model come out. This model, the XP12, takes a lot of uh, borrowed trickle-down technology from what was the excess preamplifier before this, which was much more expensive. I think the easiest way to describe what do you want in a preamplifier is more, what do you not want in it? You want it to be quiet. You don't want any noise or any distortion. This does that really well uh, in my system, in my room. I never hear any of that entering in. So this is sort of the hub where both the analog stuff from the phono preamp and the turntable get plugged in, as well as my digital source. Coming out of the preamplifier, we chose Pass Labs again. So we matched up that Pass Labs XP12 with the power amp, a Pass Labs X250.8. It's 250 in its name is because it is 250 watts. That doubles to 500 watts in four ohms. I doubt I ever use even a fraction of those, but it is nice to have them. And it is not only powerful, it is a big, heavy amp. This thing tips the scales at about 100 pounds. Not something that you really want to move around a lot by yourself with those uh, heat sinks on the side all being metal in this chassis you better be really careful because you could slip and you could cut yourself with this thing i'm speaking from experience but i love this amp when i compare it to what i had with integrated this amp just opened up my speakers more soundstage more low end just more of everything typically when i listen i listen it peaks at around like you know low to mid 80 dbs in my listening position and that meter on the front is not a VU meter, it's a bias meter. Because although this is a class A B amp, it is class A for the first 25 watts. So if you see that needle when a signal is going through it, pushes past about 11 o'clock and starts bouncing around a little more, you know you've crossed over into A B. That very rarely happens for me, if at all. Uh, but I love this amp, feel sort of no need to upgrade, really fortunate to have this in my system. And next, we will show you the speakers that this beast is powering. And we're coming out of that Pass Labs X250.8 into a pair of Wireworld Silver Eclipse 8 speaker cables and into these Wilson Audio Evets you see here on the left. Wilson Audio, some people love them, some people hate them. I've always wanted a pair. I think the design is really cool. I love the different materials they use. There's a lot of trickle-down technology in their lower-end models, which this Wilson Audio Evets are. At the time, this was the smallest floor-standing speaker that they had released in the lineup. Since then, the Sabrina has taken that title. Uh, but this speaker, make no doubt about it, is big and it is heavy. So I drove four states away and I purchased these used. And I drove four states away the same day, down and back. And on the way back, these came in giant wooden crates, and I was like hunched up against the steering wheel, could barely move the entire way home. Um, had to leave them in the car overnight because I couldn't even think about attempting to move them after that trip. And the next day, it was totally worth it, even though my back was killing me and hurt a little more after I got them into the house. So these things weigh 175 pounds. So you can see that there's three drivers in each. There's a one-inch tweeter, seven-inch mid-range, and a 10-inch woofer. I love these speakers. Wilson Audio is really particular in how you set them up. They give you very detailed instructions. I followed those instructions, and then I use the Samiko speaker placement guide to sort of fine-tune them, if you will, once they were in place. But I love these speakers. I think they're perfect for me. They're perfect for my space. Uh, I feel really fortunate to have them. Never thought I'd have a pair of Wilson Audio speakers. Um, and I love them. I don't know what else really I could say about it. Haven't felt like upgrading them at all. Uh, the way that they fill the space with 
bass and also soundstage, uh, not lacking in highs at all, but also not shrill, um, which is something that I could be very, very sensitive to is some sibilance. Uh, don't get that at all out of these speakers. So my speakers that I took the grills off, I never listen with the grills off. I have two small kids that I like having come down and listen to music and play down here. And I don't want them sticking a finger through a woofer at all. Uh, so typically I keep them on. They're a pain to take off because there's three just in the speakers, but uh, I did it for YouTube because I figured people would like to see what is behind those grills. And then beside those are a pair of subwoofers. So love the Yvette speakers. When I moved into this much larger space, I did feel like I could use a little more low end. It was having a little, little bit of a tough time filling up the room the way that I wanted to. And I started looking at subwoofers, kind of went down a rabbit hole. Previously, I had a single sub with this pair of bookshelf speakers that I had. I always felt like placement of it and fine tuning it when you had just one was kind of a pain. So I decided I wanted to go with dual subs to match the Evets. Uh, started shopping around and eventually settled on a pair of Tecton Design speakers. So Tecton Design are made in Utah, just like the Wilson Audio Evets. I got an opportunity to work with Eric, the owner of Tecton on these subwoofers. So these are based off of their 210 sub, named obviously for the two 10 inch subwoofers on it. When I talked to Eric and told him about my system and my space, he suggested that the 210s would work. They have four 10s and six 10s, which would probably go all the way up to my ceiling, be a lot more than I needed. But uh, after speaking with Eric, we did make some modifications to it. So if you see it beside that Wilson Audio Yvette, we had them custom made to essentially match the dimensions of that lower woofer portion of the Yvette. Uh, I like the symmetry of it. It also added a little more room inside of the standard 210 cabinet to generate a little lower bass. We also upgraded the plate amps in both of them. So both of the amplifiers inside of those have been upgraded. So those have their own power. They're hooked up into the Pass Labs XP12. There is also a stereo set. Um, went painstakingly placed these speakers right where they needed to be with the Wilson Audio Guide and fine-tuning it with the Samico placement process. And I decided I was just going to put the subwoofers right beside them. So I haven't had any issues uh, with any bass chuffing. Uh, it was super easy to get them set up and get them dialed in. Really didn't take more than a day or two. It was a really cool process to work with. One of the best parts of this is they completely match the finish on the Wilson Audio. So that's one of the big things with the Wilson speakers or the custom finishes. They use like car paint on this. Eric was able to completely match, and you'll see it here, the finish on the Wilson Audio Yvettes, which are amazing. It looked like they were made initially out of the factory to go beside them. I mean, these were, but they were custom. But it looks like something that would be sold as a set, which was really cool. And then on both sets of speakers, the subwoofers and the Evets, I do have isoacoustic Gaia feet on it. So that was a lot of equipment and we need a way to power it. Uh, so how do we do that? This is a big piece of it. This is an Isotech Evo 3 Aquarius. So I have all the sources and the subwoofers plugged directly into this. The only thing that is not plugged into it is the power amp. That is plugged directly into the wall. I have a 20 amp dedicated circuit that nothing else is on that line. It goes directly to my breaker box and I have two things plugged into it, this Isotech and my Pass Labs amp. So this is how I get power to everything in this system. Thank you for taking this journey with me through my hi-fi hideaway. Hope you enjoyed getting to learn about my listening room and my audio system. If you wanna see more content like this and you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. I love interacting with people in the comments section. I'm Rich, this is the VU Meters channel, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.